welcome, Paul Ernest. You're an Emeritus Professor of Philosophy of Mathematics Education at Exeter University and currently editor of a journal of the same title. And I should add that uh, your interests don't just go to the philosophy of mathematics education, but you're also widely published an authority within the philosophy of mathematics itself. Now, you, you began uh, publishing or working as a computer gram programmer many years ago. You were a comprehensive school math teacher in North London in the uh, 70s, the same time as I was. But your first publication in the topic of philosophy of mathematics education was back in 1985. Since then, you have held numerous very senior positions in the area uh, worked at a number of universities all across the world and have a publication list which is vast. But really, Paul, as a professor of the philosophy of mathematics education, the university I went to, that had put you in three different faculties. How mm -hmm. did you wind up in this uh, position? Ah, uh, Well, you see, as, a, as, as someone who was... Um promoted internally. In other words, I was a, first I was a lecturer, then a senior lecturer, then a reader, then a full professor, personal chair. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to name my own title. This is one of oh, the nice. few bits of creativity within mm -hmm. the bureaucracy. And so because I was in education and my interests were, and I was a mathematics specialist within education, my particular interest was the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics in education, mm -hmm. as well as well, I won't go <laughs> uh, all those combinations. So I was able to name myself that title. So it wasn't as if someone said, ah, oh, we have this field and we need someone mm -hmm. to, to be a chair in it. Mm -hmm. It's just that I had a chair and I was able to invent my own title. That's very nice, very nice. Um, now, as a young math teacher in the 70s in England, you would have had to teach the new maths, uh, as I did. Uh, I was, was quite handy for the school where I taught because I'd actually, you know, done university mathematics and I understood the material, which very few of the other teachers did. What do you make of that period in maths education? Uh, the, well, I was teaching in a secondary school, and so uh, it did. I mean, there was a shift in the kind of topics that were covered at school when I studied. You had geometry, you had arithmetic. Well, they didn't. Yeah, they called it arithmetic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mensuration, trigonometry, geometry, algebra. Those were the main domains of school mathematics. Mm -hmm. By the time I was teaching it, and it was probably 15 years after uh, after completing my school studies that I was teaching it in, in school again, mm -hmm. there were a lot of new topics. For example, well, there was matrices, there was mm -hmm. networks. Uh, Topology? Set theory. Top, yeah, or to, topology. Binary arithmetic. Yes, yes, that's right. Base arithmetic. Uh, yeah. Arithmetic, not only binary, but yeah. the others. And a few other things. And some of the things I taught, I wasn't familiar with, but I understand the principles upon which they, you know, for example, mm. network theory or you know, that's right. yeah. topological topics. I'd done topology, but not looking at finite networks so much. So mm. that wasn't really a problem. I could get into that. Um, I have some criticisms of the new maths. Um, uh, and w one of the problems with the school curriculum that I was teaching at the time was it was made up of many little top discrete topics. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the kids, so one week it would be fractions, another time it would be vectors, another time matrices, another time some kind of algebra. And uh, trigger. it was many, many more topics in the original three or four that we, we studied in the old days. And I don't think the connections were made between them. I, you know, that's the problem. If you fragment it up too much, I mean, Bruno had this idea of a spiral curriculum with, with these spokes of topics radiating out, radiating out from the center and the learner following this out, spiral outwardly, coming again and again to these same ideas and enriching and deepening them. And in theory, that's great. They should all be interconnected, but they weren't. They were isolated, segmented bits and I, I remember some research, I had a PhD student looking at what kind of general knowledge of mathematics our students are having, bringing to all these topics. And it was very basic. It was like elementary arithmetic, understanding of the words and problems. And those were the kind of general, and the rest, they were winging it, you know. So 
a fragment, one of the results of the new maths, the, um, in, certainly in secondary school, was the fragmentation of the curriculum. But I have another criticism, which is that the problem was that the mathematicians were given control of the curriculum in the, in the new maths that came up in the 60s. Mm. So you had this very influential Bourbaki school in mm. France who were very structural. But, uh, they thought of all mathematics. From, there were three great structural families, topological, arithmetic, and something else. And they thought everything was structures. In fact, one of them said you, you, all diagrams should be eliminated from mathematics. They Oh, God. Link to intuition, intuition. We shouldn't be having those. It should all be algebraic, concrete, and all based on set theory. So they, uh, if you look at the elements of mathematics, that uh, mm. Bourbaki, a marvelous mid twentieth century school, developed with about twenty volumes, redeveloping all of mathematics. It was all based on set theory, and then building up in a kind of grand reconstruction. Mm. When you take that to school. And you start teaching uh, seven-year-olds or whatever it is, the theory of sets. For example, instead of teaching uh, addition or instead of just using the plus sign, uh, young kids, and my daughter was doing uh, something called Fletcher Maths, which was, a, which was a new maths project, one of the things that came out of this in the 70s. No, in the early 80s. Um, for example, instead of plus, she would have open bracket, uh, number, comma, second number, close bracket, and then that's a pair, and there's an arrow function. Mm. To the, so that's a function, addition function. And, and what the new mathematicians or those who were applying didn't realize that if you add a load of grammatical symbolism, grammatical complication, it makes it very, very difficult for young children. Plus mm. is not such a difficult concept. But when mm. you get obsessed with the logical way of expressing it and trying to use a more abstract way of, of showing it, it, it really was it really was a slowdown and, a, and a, you know, an epistemological obstacle even, mm. if I can use that phrase. Mm. Um, so there were a number of things in, in, in the new, I mean, the new maths wasn't all bad. It brought in more practical work, certainly in primary mm. schools, mm. Uh, some of which was came out of Piagetian theory, and it wasn't so directly influenced by, by mathematical theory. But all in all, I think it mostly got washed away, the new maths, when people started to realize, in practice, it was not facilitating learning. Mm. So uh, that's... that's so when I, was I mean, teaching, I was teaching 14-year-olds at one stage who could count, but that was all. Mm. There were 14, they were there in year, uh, what is it, seven or eight or something, and th they had no concept of fractions. They didn't really, really understand dividing. They didn't understand the measurement of length and scale. Mm. And, and you know, to me, it was so blindingly clear that this wasn't working, yeah. but... You know, you had to teach what you were given. Yeah. I remember I had a, a class of 15-year-olds who were second bottom. They used to, they were all mm. set according to achievement. Mm. They called it ability in those days. And the second from bottom were often difficult because it wasn't that they weren't capable, but they also often had some social resistance. Mm. So they were put in there, one above the bottom set. And I remember... Uh, one of the things they quite like to do that I give them, I, I had a whole bank of worksheets I developed over my time in school, mm. was adding matrices. Because it looks fancy. You've got this bracket mm. and a square or rectangular array of numbers in it. Add to another such thing. And all you're really doing is matching up the digits and adding them. In other mm. words, it's baby arithmetic mm. wrapped up in a fancy dressing. But really, it doesn't advance your conceptual understanding at all. You know, <laughs> in real life, I can't think of any situation where you would be adding, you know, adding matrices. Uh, I mean, well, I could invent something. When you had data, you know, how you might operate on. But, um, but the trouble is with mathematics, it's always had this tradition of being separate. Yeah. And I remember when um, there was a survey of secondary schools done by HMI, the Her Majesty's Inspectorate, which was a significant force in the uh, state-run kind of set of experts run it was all changed and abolished during the Thatcher years and all that. But 
but they did a review of schools, that sort of proper research base, and they found that mathematics was the school department most isolated, mm. uh, most likely not to have links with others. Uh, the next one was music, because they, mm. they do their mm. own thing in a way. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so in a way, mathematics, because it really doesn't have a subject matter, dare I say that, mm. um, I mean, it's a body of techniques. Mm. It really could come to life so much more if you made links with science, with geography, with history, even with English and, you know, all the other things. But uh, I remember myself as a mathematics teacher when we strayed into something saying, oh, well, that's for the English department, not for us. Mm. And so I was, even though I'm critical of it, was actually helping to install the mm. barriers between mm. subjects which are mm. artificial and actually deprive mathematics of meaning. Yeah. Tell me, Paul, what is the proper relation between the, the stru logical structure of mathematics that the Bourbaki people began from, the history of mathematics, you know, from the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Islamic people and all that stuff, and the sequence in which things can be taught and learned? What's the relation between those? That's a very good question, and it's a deep question. and. In a sense, those are three different domains, and I have separated them in some publications I've done, mm. because and the most deceptive of those is the one you mentioned first, the mm. logical structure as perceived from a certain foundational perspective. Yes. So, yes. for example, and, and really that hardly came, well, I suppose it, re, it had its model in Euclid. Euclid's mm. elements starts with axioms mm. and various things. Mm. It's a formal model. It's a I'm formal sure. model that yeah. develops, a, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. You have the foundations, the axioms and whatever, and then gradually you, you go up one level where you prove certain basic theorems, then you use them to prove another lot, and you develop the logic, the knowledge logically like that. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it can be beautiful, and to some minds, it's very mm -hmm. exciting. Yes. You, you know, if you look back through history, people like Bacon or various other people, Descartes, they said, I saw that and I fell in love. Mm. But for most people, you know, in about the second level, when you've done a few basic theorems, then you have to go across this logical development. Mm. And that was called the, the bridge of acid, because for a lot of people, making that abstract leap across was very mm. difficult. So mm. that was already a pedagogical obstacle as recognized yeah. in ancient or, you know, well, much earlier times. Mm. So you've got this logical development. And um, the problem is that sequence really is an obstacle, is, is problematic if you try and bring that into education. Of course, you need in some cruder way to do simpler things before more complex things. Mm. Uh, you know, you start with the addition of whole numbers before you start doing division of decimals, mm. you know, because there's a sequence in which the concepts develop and become higher and more complex mm. but that doesn't mean that you start with a logical sequencing with axioms and uh, mm. you know a formal logical sequencing so that's been a problem uh, the great um, the philosopher of mathematics um, Imri Lakatos who sadly mm. died young in 1974 he talked about a, a pedagogical inversion and he regarded it as a great evil he said that you know you've got the uh, the historical development is one thing. Then when you make it all tidy and pretty, you've inverted mm. that. That's and right. that and that is an obstruction when you try and teach it mm. because you're showing people the final theorem and then going, bringing it back. Whereas in fact, you start with simpler things and, and then through trial and error, and he, mm. he called his book, his famous, his most important book, Proofs and Refutations, because he was looking mm. at a particular result in topology, um, that how... People had a go uh, at, at, at defining a, a, a relationship and then trying to prove it. And other people found exceptions. And then they had to modify the proofs, modify the definition. And gradually that process took one upwards to the result, which didn't come out of a hat. It was historically developed. Mm -hmm. So, but What about the relation between the historical and the uh, sequence in which they're learned? And here is quite interesting to look at human genetics in the sense that we've got a gene, uh, uh, sorry, we've got genes and we've got uh, DNA and they will build your body. 
but your body but they're not a map of how your body is built now i suppose the parallel between the historical development of mathematics and the psychological development of mathematics and uh, and in a sense i'm uneasy when i say the psychological development of mathematics because there are many possible ways it could develop mm. uh, and indeed the history of mathematics is multiple as well yeah. and and there are there are contests about whose history who invented what i mean in india they had infinite series uh, almost 200 years before newton did some important work in that respect they didn't you know they, they because they'd invented floating decimal points and all sorts of arithmetic stuff uh, Europe came upon this stuff late, and yet Europe claims credit for it. Mm. That's a side issue. I'll come back to your main point. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, there have been ideas for 150 years or more that there's an analogy between the historical development and, and individuals' de understanding development. And there was a famous Heckel, the German... Mm. Um, Branch uh, Heckel. Mm. And he talked about, he said, ontology recapitulates phil phylogeny. Mm. In other words, the individual growth, uh, it follows the same pattern as cultural growth. Mm. And it's both true and false. Uh, mm. There are parallels, mm. but there are also uh, lacks of parallel. And that, so the history is a good guide or, or a source, should I say, rather than mm. a guide. You can draw lots of examples and there's, you know, and I think looking at the way historians grappled with certain problems um, and indeed conceptualized and invented those problems is interesting. And that can enrich mathematics, which earlier I described as a subject with, n with no content. You know, the cultural context, in a way, the problems it was addressed to solve historically is the content, but that's sort of been washed out by, by you know, in the neutralization and the, making it just a cold collection of techniques. Mm. If it, it's a miracle that mathematics succeeds so well with a small minority. Yeah. And, in, you know, that they fall in love with it and they see it as this purified, wonderful, angelic, mm. crystalline realm of, mm. of bridges of crystal and diamond nets and mm. all these interconnected, wonderful things. And mm. I can appreciate that to some extent myself, mm. having studied math to a high level. Mm. But it's quite a closed book or at least that aspect of it to many mm. people so would it be true to say it's the problems which mathematics solves which is the proper starting point for learning i don't know it's like when you you see to be honest i've been involved in the teaching of math for 40 plus years mm. and i think i know I won't say I know less, but I'm less certain of my mm. answers now than I was mm. at the beginning. I don't think there is a royal road to learning maths. I think there are many ways. Sometimes they depend on the vision of the, and power of the teacher. If they can communicate that, uh, however they do it, whether it's a formal or historical or activities or practical activities, going out measuring things, how, however they can motivate it in different ways, that can really work. But when you try and make that into a curriculum for everybody and then say, well, this is how you do it, there's a dilution between what that person who had a, had a vision and had a passion for mm. is very hard to communicate um, mm. and just hand it over to other people to give a curriculum that can be delivered. So mm. there are people who can teach formally. And I think, you know, when I was, when I was taught maths, um, we do lots of exercise in algebra like... 2a plus 3a plus uh, 5b minus 7b or something like that mm. and then you'd have to simplify that mm. so the 2a plus yeah. 3a would become 5a and whatever else the rest yeah. comes to i've forgotten already what i made up <laughs> um and it and you'd have a sheet of 30 of those mm. and then there was sheets of loads of um factorization <laughs> You know. Talking about many years of my life at school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I developed a facility for it. I even quite enjoyed it as a sort of game. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was quite good at Euclidean geometry, which was on the curriculum when I did it. Mm. But I never really understood it. Actually, when I, when I was teaching geometry in the new maths era, we were looking more at uh, what you, transformational geometry rather mm. than Euclidean geometry. Yeah. And I finally got the idea in transformational geometry, you're looking... You take one geometric shape, a triangle, and mm. then if you can place another on it, if it fits exactly, mm. that notion of 
equivalents. No, they are identical shapes, except they may vary in in you know left right handedness. Yeah, isomorphism or something. Yeah, well, they didn't mm. use that word. Mm. That's the word. It's a word for whatever it is you do in Euclidean geometry to prove yeah. equivalence, maybe. You mm. know, and there and there were rules like. Uh, two angles and an sorry two sides and an included angle if you could demonstrate that two triangles had the same length sides and the mm. same included angle then you could prove then they were equivalent or whatever that word was mm. it probably turned out to be equivalent yeah. um but i didn't understand it was a technique you know mm. what's special about two sides and i didn't realize it was a necessary and sufficient condition mm. for those two triangles to be identical in all but orientation mm. so there was a sense in which in the formality although i could do you could enjoy i never really got what it was about in transformation so can i have a try another go at, at uh, guessing this that you you have to start with something that interests the pupil rather than saying that as you say there's some you know uh basic you know timeless task that my mathematics was meant for but that in some child's life in their culture in their interest will be some problems and that if mathematics answers to anything that they've got there then that's a point from which learning can begin well, that's one way but another way is the puzzle way if you can set people puzzles which really have nothing to do with life if yeah. you have a puzzle something to solve that is also in, intriguing and wonderful. Look at the success mm. of Sudoku and uh, you know, yeah. uh, and very, you know, crosswords and and many other kinds of puzzles. So, mm. if there's a challenge, that's another way. One way is to see how things mm. are reflected in the world. Another is puzzles. Another mm. uh, is just so if you can grab a child's interest so that they are challenged by and interested in solving the puzzle, then you've got a hook. You, you've got to start. If they don't have any particular problem they're struggling with to begin with, an attractive puzzle can do the trick, maybe. I think so. I think puzzles, yeah. applications, various problems, various applied issues, those are some of the ways in. But currently what I'm looking at is the notion of power. Um, so this is now getting really abstract and moving away from that. But, but we'll, I'll come back and, and offer a semi-critique, or at least a, another way of looking at it, which is that, I think schooling is a, a lot about getting children to accept tasks that, uh, that first of all, it's about uh, preschooling is about seeing the world in a way that's amenable to mathematics. Mm. I don't think the world comes given, ready-made, yeah. mathematizable. I think you've got to, and of course you can link this with capitalism, with trade, with with the big concerns that early civilizations mm. had, tax, mm. um, trade, and what's the other mm. thing? Uh, spread of diseases. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is now, um, first of all, you've got to see the world in a way that's a, a, amenable to mathematical conceptualization. That mm. often starts with number. And so um, you see the world as made up of objects. You individuate, individuate things. Then you learn a way of, dealing with that mathematical you learn a number sequence the ordinals except we just call them the numbers one mm. two three four five we have verbal names for them but we also have a whole technology of how to write it and we know how all the different civilizations mm. have, have written numbers in different ways mm. some of them are limited like the romans they can only get up to four or five thousand unless they start adding extra bits because they only use a limited number tell of me letters. paul i read uh, your paper or chapter recently about the ontology of mathematics that begins with counting. Uh, and of course, most children will arrive in the mathematic classroom with the ability to count, which is good. And the first abstraction that comes out of this is the cardinal number, the answer to the question of how many. Yeah. Why not uh, the uh, ordinal number? Say you've got a lot of objects you're interested in some are bigger than others. And so you say, well, look, let's arrange them in order and say this is the biggest. And, hey, look, we can give each of these things a number according to, um, you know, whether it's the first, second, third or fourth biggest and so on. Um, what, what would be, is there any reason that that wouldn't form either a pedagogical beginning or a, a foundation for the philosophy of mathematics? That's interesting, but... I 
when I agreed with you that cardinal numbers are the first, actually cardinal numbers come out of ordinal numbers. Yes. So now you were talking about comparing sizes, but uh, if I want to talk about ordinal numbers, just first, second, third, they don't actually have to be bigger as you go up. Although we tend to mm. we tend to associate might be your favorite and your second favorite. They're further along in the sequence that yeah. starts at a fixed point. Mm. And so you do have a, uh, ordinals. The trouble is if you assign ordinals to a set of objects, um, you can start counting anywhere. And the rules are that you mustn't count anything twice mm -hmm. and that you must count everything in that cluster, that group, mm. that thing you're set you're trying to. And then the f last ordinal number is, of course, the cardinal numerality, you know, value, mm -hmm. cardinal number assigned to that set. So I can count my five fingers in any order. Mm -hmm. I mustn't miss any out. And I must have a, 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 a sequence of numbers that is invariant. And I will, and then the fifth number tells me there's five. In, the number five, the fifth finger numerated, tells me there's five in that set. So is there any sense that, in which, though, the cardinal number is somehow more fundamental than the ordinal? Well, it's more needed. I mean, uh -huh. you could say logically it is because it's more invariant. So mm -hmm. um, you can assign ordinals in lots of different ways. Sure. You should, mm -hmm. if you're counting correctly, always come up with the same last ordinal, mm -hmm. and that becomes sure. then the cardinal. Yeah. But the fact is that you can order things in different ways that ordering isn't in the order isn't need to be invariant but the but the total ordinality which becomes a cardinal mm -hmm. does need to be invariant and yeah. why because my claim is that uh, numbers were primarily used to keep tabs of trade mm -hmm. tribute tax yeah. and that you needed some symbolic system that would keep the quantity of goods Mm. that will record and will reflect mm. the invariant quantity of goods. When mm. you're sending 10 ingots of, of uh, tin from Cornwall to Rome or, or earlier on, wherever, Phoenicia, mm. the Phoenician Empire, you, you want to have a system whereby you can say, yes, we, we bought those 10 ingots, and what's arrived is 10 ingots, and we mm. know that numbers are constant. They don't change. Yeah. So therefore, yeah. uh, you know, what you ask for is what you get. So yeah. it's, it's, it's the invariant, the, invariant, invariant yeah, character invariant. of the cardinal, which gives that sort of uh, very sure feeling, yeah. <laughs> rightly or wrongly. Yeah. I, my, my argument is that um, if, you, if you have an invariant system of numbers that gives you invariant cardinals, then the, the invariance of rules follows. So that mm. once you've got the set of numbers set up, as far as you need, and you've got the order invariant, then if you add, subtract, multiply, or divide collections of items, which in concrete practice means uniting collections or partitioning them mm. or dividing them up into little segments, mm. those manipulations of those collections of concrete items will remain invariant. That when you, you know, when you divide off 20 ingots for, and separate them from 30 ingots, you have 50 is our, and when you recombine them, you will still have the same number. In other words, mm. invariance pers mm. persists after, mm. after those operations. Mm. But I didn't finish my earlier answer because I was starting to talk about power. This yeah. relates to this, um, which is that in teaching schooling, and this, you know, this is conjectural, but it's where I'm at in my thinking. One of the things we're teaching, as well as making the world susceptible to counting, and now in late capitalism, we see we count everything. It's mm. not just features of the natural world that we see mm. as susceptible to counting. It's the human character traits, the way you structure. So everything is numeralized, and uh, there are a whole other issues. But the issue of power, that... Um, you are imposing the sequence on children and they enjoy it as a game. They learn their numbers. And if they, if they start going up the steps and go one, three, five, seven, <laughs> six, no, the one that comes after five is six. So mm. kids learn that invariant sequence. Um, and, and then we send them to school and they're expected to know that. And then we set them tasks. Now tasks are a point of power. It's saying, here is an activity, here is an action, here is something, here is a goal mm. that we want you to, uh, that 
we require you to address. Mm. And of course, this has started in the home where the, where, the, where the parent will say, go clear up your room, go put your shoes on. Do you want help tying your shoelaces? You have your dinner, do this. That, that parenting, there's a lot of ordering in it mm. uh, for good reason. I'm not condemning it. I'm just trying mm. to wake up to it. And mm. that persists into schooling mm. where the central activity of schooling, I think in all subjects, but especially in mathematics, is the task mm. where you are given, you can call it a puzzle, a problem, an application, or a simple little copying something that someone else has done, but you're said, it is your role as a student to do that activity that the teacher mm. has taught you. And mm. unlike other subjects, that necessity, that power, and I'm not saying it's an unjust mm. or horrible yeah. power, but it's a direction. It's a, it can be soft, it can be hard, as we know about schooling. That is also embedded in the language of mathematics, that when, that when you see mathematical tasks, unlike, it, say in English, it might be pray see this paragraph or, or this, you know, all right, that is, a, that is an order. But, um, but then you engage with the meaning of the text. In mathematics, all the activities have, have, a, have a power dimension to them. So when you're adding, then there is a way that you have to do it that's imposed on you, not by mm. mathematics. Mathematics is not, does not exist as a superhuman entity that's leaning over you and forcing <laughs> you. It's human beings who've told you there's only one way to add, or at least initially, mm. and that will be putting these things together in this way. And here we want you to do 100 examples, of, you know, in varying depth. Not a lot of exploration going on. Well, there may even be exploration, but that's still the result of orders. Mm. It might be find way, find all the different ways you can, oh, all yeah. the numbers, you, yeah. you know, that have, sorry, find all the sums that have the answer seven. Yeah. That is all, that's a softer kind of power that mm. offers the child a chance to, there's always a little bit of room, or sorry, mm. not always, in many tasks, there's a little bit of wiggle room where you can choose to apply the different skills, concepts, and algorithms. You have to put them together creatively. That's where creativity mm. in maths comes in. Or sometimes they're just direct orders, just follow the sequence as you've seen before. Mm. But nonetheless, one is softer, one is harder. They are all about directing the child to do these things. Mm. And a lot of those things don't have any real world payoff. They are mm. tasks imposed by the teacher. Mm. But they can be, you know, as I said, puzzles can be joyful, can be interesting. You know, kids can enjoy doing puzzles. I do Wordle and Maffler on my mm. phone, these puzzles that, you know, and they're, you know, as an old person, I know that it's good for me to keep my yeah. brain ticking up, but I also enjoy it. Uh, um, so anyway, I think the role of power and force in school is under stress. Mm. Uh, there are I know a lot of... A lot of other ethical issues in the mathematics, not only in how it's taught, but in general in its place in uh, modern capitalist society. What are the ethical issues, apart from this one, that, that trouble you, I feel like, at the moment? Well, I'm not even saying it's bad. I'm not, say, I'm not making an ethical judgment about the force, the power within school math, but I think it does make you look a bit at, at, at maths refusers, people who are damaged by being forced to do something they find difficult or meaningless. So I think we, sh you know, so there is that. We, the benefits of teaching maths weighed against the costs for some for a minority is an ethical issue. But putting that aside, as you've asked me to do, then there's the issue of the ethics of mathematics in society. The, um, first of all, the applications but also, I think even that mathematical way of seeing the world that I started mm. off by describing, mm. making the world accessible to numeration, that there's ethical issues in that, that people leaving schooling with this finely developed mathematical way of seeing everything in the world, which actually you, you, you lose passion and love and lots of things when you start to turn things into numbers. Mm. When, especially when you start to use it in social policy and you start to treat people as just numbers and resources. Now, I've got to, I've got to hedge that because if you're spending millions of dollars or pounds on social, good social projects like health or whatever, you do have to abstract. You do have to think about, uh, you know, 
the money you're spending on schools. You, you've got to, you know, make it a uh, um, you quantifier and you're playing with resources. But behind you, you've got principles that are trying to make that helpful. So I'm not saying any way of seeing the world numerically or in terms of resources is intrinsically bad. The trouble is it can lead to desensitization, uh, the denial of, of, of um, uh, ethical uh, involvement or, you know, you know, I mean, maths is supremely seen as neutral. So a lot of people use maths as a way of seeing the world and they feel they're absolved from ethics. So mm. it's not intrinsically unethical, but the way we use it, we often stress that side. Mm. Um, now, I've, I have written about a number of different ways that maths can be used and, and I haven't exhausted. I mean, one is in terms of um, communication, you know, governments and, and um, uh, companies doing math washing. Uh, trying to present things with mathematical adjuncts in the advertisement, you know, like uh, uh, this this antiseptic kills 99.99% of germs. And then the small print says in laboratory conditions, in the ordinary world, it kills 68% or something like that. So that that's a simple example of math washing, where you use a bit of mathematics, not to strengthen your argument, but to blind people with science to make them think, ah, there's numbers, there's maths in it, therefore it's truer than if it was just verbalist. Mm. And we see all governments and all businesses do this. Um, mm. So there's the, the communication aspect. Then there are direct applications that are problematic. For example, we see an awful lot of apps, as they call them now, we used to call them programs, working on social data. There was that big scandal, which is just representative of how the Facebook data was used to make profiles of millions of people who are either users of Facebook or friends of the users of, and connect up all the other data about their shopping habits, their political affiliations, all that big mass of data out there. And then it was used to try and target people politically to send them messages that would push their, their emotional buttons, make the, and people, it's so much easier to make people angry or fearful than to make, than to build positive things. And hence you saw outcomes like Trump getting into power, Brexit in Britain, uh, you know, throughout this war in Ukraine. Um, uh, um, what's his name? Putin is, has got a team of people sending out all this dis disinformation, trying to manipulate people. Now, at the base of all that uh, stuff coming out is mathematical analysis. So mm -hmm. it uses maths as a tool. It's a direct application of mathematics. The fourth one I already mentioned, Get, make, giving people a mathematical cast of mind so mm -hmm. that they deal with social issues in a dispassionate, unreasoning, un uncaring and disconnected way. Uh, so I am thinking that that um, doesn't, you know, that dehumanizes, that doesn't see. But now, so that I've, I've done my first, second and fourth. And the third method of, uh, of that mathematics has ethical issues is, is performativity, that it's built into many systems and we don't even know that we put it in there but it's now making decisions um mm. the computer says no i mm. need these benefits but the computer says no in other words they've programmed a a um a set of policies to decisions mathematically into a system and then they ha then and and they may not even anticipate the problems that come out of that um but it's a, a way in which mathematics is shaping society and there's and governments need to be very critical and have quick feedback loops to think are we getting i mean a well-known example is in america where they apply these um, um automated uh risk of reoffending measures where so for example you get uh, someone who's coming up towards the courts and they've got an algorithm that looks at where do they live what is their past record what is their educational attainment blah 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 and works out based on statistics of some past pattern, their chance of reoffending. And the, the well-known case is this young black girl who had stolen a bike and had had one or two run-ins with the law. She was, she was given an eight out of 10, whereas this career, career criminal who lived in a respectable white neighborhood, that's a lot of plus points, and uh, who hadn't been caught for that many crimes, but they'd been more serious than stealing a bike, he ended up in jail after this being let off. He got a score of three and went on to be a bank robber. So 
uh, that's just uh, one example. I, it might be in that um, uh, math, what's it called? Weapons of math destruction. <laughs> Very good. But anyway, sorry, you indulged me by letting me carry on with my... No, no, not at all. That was very interesting. Maybe my question is going to another one. Mathematics is commonly thought to produce a certainty, provided that you start off with something that's true. And I understand that this is a misconception that mathematics doesn't, in fact, always produce certainties, and, in fact, is riddled with uncertainty. Is that the case? Yes, it's a very complex issue because, as I said, basic mathematics or is a lot of the language, a lot of the verbs in mathematics are commands. A lot mm. of mathematics is commands. You start with a certain given position, you have to follow these commands, and you get a result, which is a certainty, if you like, within that game, right? Mm. Just as in chess, you, you know, you have the rules of chess. And if you make certain moves, you end up with checkmate. And people can predict that. There are puzzles, um, you know, um, or, 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 you know, you, this is the board set up, you know, how, can white defeat black in three moves? And if you follow these moves, that, you know, whatever black does, they are checkmated. Now, the difference between that model and mathematics is that it, chess is rather arbitrary. It starts off with a, a strange, you know, whereas, as I said, mathematics comes out of the way we deal with the world for certain social interests. So it's not arbitrary. It's, uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's contingent. But once you've set up those rules, then many things follow by certain. So, for example, my claim earlier was that if you have an invariant sequence of national, natural numbers, then the, then the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, as we understand them, will prove to be invariant. In other words, you can do them and undo them and you always get the same answers out of them. Those are certainties. Two plus two is always four, provided we're within that system. <laughs> so that's one aspect. But there are also, there's a deep philosophical issue of, of um, uh, you know, Gödel's theorems, which, <laughs> which and, and other uncertainty theorems, or that's an incompleteness theorem, um, whereby... Uh, there may be flaws in the system. So as good as the story I just gave about how it all follows with certainty, it is possible. You can't demonstrate that certainty. You have to take that on trust. You, you know, uh, and so that's something that's, that's worried mathematicians for the past 90 years since Gödel's proof in 1931. But there were many other paradoxes and limitative results in mathematics before that as well. Um, so the whole system is not guaranteed. We can, you know, I mean, I think it's actually arrogant to think that we, this minuscule, uh, you know, biological species at this certain stage in our development, who are quite clever and, and can talk and have all these ideas and can write, think that we have seen through to the heart of certainty and that nothing in, in our imaginations mm -hmm. or in the world could possibly contradict it. What hubris! How dare we think mm. that that this little creature? You know, imagine imagine an amoeba saying, "I got the world sorted out. The world is flat. You know, uh, there are some good bits and some bad bits, some tasty bits, not tasty bits. That's the nature of reality with certainty. You know, our, our view is limited by our biology. Our, you know, we do have a cultural way of seeing the world, which makes us wonderful. But uh, you know, to think that we can." It's like trying to create a god on earth, you know, to mm. say that we have that. So, but mm. I was getting a bit out of the more. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, okay. um, I, I gather that you were well into this topic uh, before you came across uh, Vygotsky and activity theory. But tell me about your first encounter with uh, Vygotsky and the activity theorists. Well, in the 80s, there was a lot of interest in. Piaget and radical constructivism, and I wrote several papers on that. And when I wrote my book, The Philosophy of Mathematics Education, which came out in 91, um, uh, I used a sort of post Piagetian constructivist basis for, I talked about conversation as a, as a basic element, as a, mm. uh, as a unit of analysis, sort of. I didn't, you know, not quite mm. in the detailed and precise way that you've elucidated it yourself. Uh, but I was using, and I thought, and I said that we could maybe add some other axioms or insights onto Piagetian. Now, 
I was criticized because there were quite a few people in the mass ed community who had moved on from Piagetian way of seeing the world to a Vygotskian way. Those are not the only two ways, but, but Piagetian is very individualistic and Vygotskian is much more social. And so by 1994, I'd, I'd come to change my views, looking more deeply at Vygotsky uh, and using his way of seeing learning uh, rather than the um, uh, Piagetian view of this little lonely explorer in this alien universe, but seeing, you know, and, and also having adopted the notion of conversation, which, uh, which is an, you know, essentially social, I realized that the social is not just something superficial that you add on to individuals. It's actually really deep. It's, it's the stuff that makes individuals. Um, and, and so I wrote a paper in 94 explaining the differences between, you know, an earlier version of social constructivism, as I called it, and my later version, which was building on Vygotsky instead. And then I fleshed that out better in my 98 book, Social Constructivism as a Philosophy of Mathematics. I've gone fully Vygotskyan, if you like, mm -hmm. or at least my understanding of it, because I'm sure mm -hmm. that other scholars would mm -hmm. see flaws. And it's so hard to eliminate the traces of individualism from one's own thinking, mm -hmm. that this is an ideology that's permeated Western thought, maybe throughout the time of Christianity. I went to um, an exhibition at the British Museum last week on Stonehenge, and one of the interesting things was, and it's not just about Stone, it's a whole era, 4000 BCE to 1000 BC. And there was a shift in that era from social organizations, social thinking towards individualization, from group graves to individual graves with all sorts of... So that, that, that notion of individual, individualism, that ideology, is quite a, a, an old one, a long one, and it permeates our thought. And so in a way, I was trying to invest in, disinvest myself from the Piagetian in, in individualism, moving towards Vygotsky. And I've had to deepen my ideas since. But uh, that is, so in other words, it was uh, in the 90s, the early 90s, that I mm. got a uh, better sure. grip on. Tell me, relevant to that, um, is mathematics a discourse or is it a practice? Well... What's the difference? I mean, that was a quite, you know, if you look at discourse, discursive practices in, in uh, the language of Foucault, uh, you could say that, um, uh, you know, that you have a discursive practices. Maybe the post-structuralists and post-modernists float a little bit too high above the actual embodied concrete. You know, maybe they're in the realm of symbols and languages and all that. I don't think so. I think Foucault was trying to look at, uh, and, it, you know, he didn't do much on mathematics anyway, so applying it. Um, but his idea was that we have these regimes of truth, a socially imposed way or shared, shared way of seeing things. And I think mathematics is one of those. But it's also, you can't deny that it's a social practice. That, you know, I, I don't want to, I want to get away from dualism, that you've got the realm of ideas and the realm of bodies. So I think that all ideas, all intellectual stuff, are part of our material practices. And of course, that's part of Vygotskyanism and activity theory. And, you know, and again, it's part of my journey. So I think, yes, mathematics is a discourse, but never forget that a discourse is something shared by people engaged in material activity, in which case now you're talking about social practices. Yeah, I and, think and the, I was interested in your answer to that. And of course, there's a great deal in what you say that, you know, how can you separate them? Of course you can't. I think Vygotsky's answer to the question, if he were asked that, was that they're, they're distinct in the course of development, that uh, in the very beginnings of human uh, culture, you know, in, uh, there was practice doing things out of practice and cooperation, creation of tools and things arose a discourse, yeah? Um, yeah. And that yeah. the... There was a struggle within the Soviet orthodoxy under Stalin to try and subordinate um, uh, discourse or, or liter literacy to um, practical intellect, doing things, labour. And so and he sensed that arriving and insisted on the distinction but accepted the important fact that they are connected through development, yeah? as you say. You, you can't, well, 
Oh, you didn't exactly say, but if you're talking about a discourse, it's a discourse about some kind of practice, yeah, even yeah. if that's quite remote from the discourse. So you, you raise an interesting point, which is, or, you know, a superficial point in a way, but which is the, when we're talking about differences, are we talking about differences in origins, which is a historical perspective, or are we talking about philosophical differences in a way, how we conceptualize them? Mm -hmm. And where we are now is that we have both discourses and practices. But of course, I fully agree with you historically and even conceptually mm -hmm. that, that, you know, if you look at animals that coexist in groups, and we're just another set of animals that coexist in groups, uh, you know, they start off with activities, as you say, mm -hmm. and then communication may play a small part at first in helping to direct and coordinate those activities. I'm thinking about ants and bees and various other things. And then you get to more elaborated animals. And, and I, but I don't know animals who sit around chatting so much like we do. Uh, so, you know, that's the humans who've managed to detach discourse more from, from uh, social practices. But yes, indeed. And, and my source is, is, is rather than Vygotsky, has also been um, Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. but, because he talks about his fundamental idea. He says, I'm not a theoretician. I'm just raising, you know, I'm trying to get the fly out of the bottle. I'm trying to understand things through language. But nonetheless, his basic theoretical ideas, or some of them are language games in forms of life. So that's discursive practices that are, take place and are embedded in and made meaningful mm -hmm. by social practices. Mm -hmm. Now, so that, that's something I often refer to. But of course, an immediate criticism of that and of many, of much of Anglo philosophy is that he puts it in a timeless present. So he doesn't mm. bring in, how does it all originate? You know, mm. how do they tie in together? How, how do beings evolve? How does culture evolve? You know, what about changes? Western philosophy has often been so static in its conception. Mm. It wants certainty, objectivity, uh, everything neat, cut up, in its little place on the shelves, on the walls, rather mm. than seeing like, you know, seeing ideas and things are forming and growing. So uh, nonetheless, I find that Wittgensteinian view, he's trying to stay, take a step out of that static mm. uh, anglo philosophical mm. perspective. I think if you historicize, that makes a lot of sense. Um, some people hate and fear mathematics like other people hate and fear spiders. Is given that you have someone that is uh, you know, uh, incapable of coming anywhere near a mathematical thought, is there any solution? Well, I first of all, I'm spider phobic myself, and so it's, <laughs> it's something that's made me fearful of going to Australia in your summer because I gather you get a lot of these bloody huntsmen wandering around people, they're harmless. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but they're not psychically harmless. They're <laughs> terrifying. People. So, yes, I mean, they talk about mathophobia. So there is an analogy of being phobic about spiders. They do say you can be de des desensitized. But, it, but I tell you the difference. And the funny thing about mathophobia or people who feel they can't do any mathematics is, I mean, I met a woman once in South Africa when I was on a lecture tour. And I, you know, and it was, what do you do, blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, I hate mathematics. I can't do mathematics. I've never been able to do mathematics. I said, what do you do for a job? She says, well, I manage a number of funds for a number of people. Uh, you know, it's sort of investment banking. Stuff. And I'm going, and you say you can't do mathematics. You're doing mathematics in all but name. You know, rich, complex, abstract ideas, number, numerical quantities, numbers. So a lot of mathematics... It often depends on what you mean by mathematics. A lot of people, when, you, when they say, I hate mathematics, what they mean is, I got really bad memories of my experience in school studying mathematics and, and terrible experiences. And, and, and I could say that sometimes you have one experience, mm -hmm. and, and a good friend of mine who hates mathematics, he says, um, said that he was made to stand up. Now, what was it he had to do? He had to stand up in primary school and either recite a times table or something that he was meant to know by heart. And he was made fearful, uh, feel, feel to feel ridiculous. He failed. It was a horrible uh, risk. He was exposed to risk, and he was treated unkindly. And he he retained that memory mm. of of you know 
associated with mathematics of a horrible, nasty experience that he would that it was sensible for him to try and avoid because of the negative consequences. Mm. So he's actually quite a numerate person. He's uh, he's done lots of work in photography. He's been dean of a faculty of arts where there's all sorts of numbers and you know things to manage. But somehow he would still say he's maths phobic. Now I can't tell you I've got super ways of dealing with it. Although I do I do know I remember working with someone at Exeter who they had a course for adults who not managed to get maths in schooling, but who wanted to get some maths qualification so they could get back into higher education. Mm. Um, and and so they had a way of teaching maths, a special co a numeracy course, where they tried to make it more concrete, where they tried to encourage people. And, and, and for many people, this worked. They got a sense that, oh yeah, I can do that. It's not as fearful or as bad. They got a second crack at it. Um, as I said, some of the characteristics of school mathematics are that there's a lot of force involved or, or implied force. You must do these tasks. There's a lot of lack of meaning involved. You do this, you do that, never mind what it means. These are the rules you apply. And I think, as I said earlier, there are victims of that. Mm. Couple that with, with um, jeopardy situations where you're, where you're challenged, criticized, exposed to ridicule, that can really switch people off. The good news is that you can, the opposite happens too. Sometimes people have one experience in maths. Mm. And I remember a case of one guy who wrote a paper about this, how he, he was set, there was set up, a teacher didn't think much of him or whatever in mathematics, but he set this puzzle one day and it sort of seized this kid. And he went home and he thought about it and he did some notes and he tried to solve the puzzle. He got halfway on the back of an envelope and he came and showed it to the teacher and said, you know, that sort of grabbed me. I didn't get very far. And the teacher said, that's really good. That's really interesting. And something switched on in him. Yes. So people forget that schooling is often really about the relationship between the student and the teacher, mm -hmm. that we care so much about how other people feel about it. Some people may build up a shell work, but we are really quite susceptible. And that susceptibility is why we're good at learning. In general, the human species is amazing at learning. If you look mm -hmm. at all the culture and how much people know, we pick it all up. And learning is always through interpersonal interactions, and there's always a correction involved, but that correction needs to be done in a way that isn't ego involved, doesn't make you feel belittled. You know, when you learn to speak language with your parents or whoever you're learning from, they will correct you when you say, you know, oh, look, two mouses. They'll say, yeah, uh, we say, we, we actually say mice. That, you know, it's silly. I know it should be mouses, but we say mice. And kids pick that up and they don't feel, oh, I've done something terrible. In the same way, correction is so important for shaping our knowledge. It is the social mechanism where our knowledge is shaped uh, while we're engaged in those activities with people, which is why I put conversation as my, uh, as my um, you, unit of analysis. I believe you also have written about uh, identity, identity as someone who can do mathematics. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes. I mean, I was wondering about that term because in that paper that you read of mine recently, I talked about mathematical identity. And I'm not entirely happy with that word. First of all, I had to move, you know, say what I mean by identity isn't really membership of groups. It's often used in sociology. Mm. You have identities, you know, the different kinds of groups you're a part of. Because, mm. And so I'm thinking maybe mathematical subjectivity will be a better term for it. How mm. you feel or, or what it is in you, the powers that are built up in you uh, as a student of mathematics. So in a sense, it was looking in abstract terms at what the trajectory of the mathematics student, how you have to engage with mathematics at a number of different levels to build up your powers mm. and skills, partly because society wants you to gain those skills. Um, those are, it's, it's, you know, mathematics is a hidden expectation for us. Mm. Families are expected to teach their children numbers. Um, I, in it, I, I did write a paper in the last year or two about the deep ethics of mathematics, where I was not going on about good or ill, but just saying that we have to acknowledge our responsibility in that we're inducting young humans into this way of seeing the world. It is an ethical decision. Maybe it's for the good. We assume it's for the good, that to have a mathematically literate as well as a uh, literally literate population. Mm. But I did note in that an example of some 
um, Aboriginal peoples, I think it was the Pitanjara, a friend of mine in Australia um, wrote a paper where she's talking about teaching um, arithmetic to some Aboriginal children and being involved with their parents and, and meeting some resistance. And at a parent's evening, um, uh, uh, some of the parents came to her and said, you, you know, um, you, you, your mathematics is a really, you know, and your arithmetic, you know, is a noble, no doubt, an interesting and clever way of doing things. But, you know, in our culture, to compare, to measure, to bring all those notions in is actually insulting. You know, it's, it, it, it's degrading. You know, we, those are antithetical to our ways of seeing things. <laughs> and um, so they said, I think we'll withdraw our children. Uh, now, that shows a, a, an ethical way of looking at arithmetic, that arithmetic, there's nothing in the world that says we have to learn it. I mean, I think if you want to engage with modern you know, societies, the way they're organized, it is an important skill. But it's also good to remember that we're choosing to impose that. Um, and it, there's no necessity behind it, or it's a practical necessity, rather than, a, you know, that, that some cultures feel the damage of that. I mean, many traditional mm -hmm. cultures around the world, um, in North America, and the Aboriginal, all sorts of places, have been degraded by us imposing our ideas on the young, mm -hmm. sometimes stealing the young and enforcing them into Western education. So what I'm saying is, we shouldn't lose sight of that. We shouldn't, um, in fact, I'm just, I just received a paper from someone, a, a Christian living in, in um, is the West Bank, who's talking about, he was a mathematician, a successful trained mathematician. His mother was a, uh, was an un, was a initially illiterate, uh, Taylor or, or and that she had a wonderful grasp of the practical geometry of the human body and could make things to fit all sorts of shapes and that you know and that he was taught that his way of seeing geometry was far superior and this is his reflection in his maturity about how that that disregard that degrading that looking down on those wonderful practical skills and knowledges uh, is is a problematic ethical position.